The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the epistle to the Hebrews in the first chapter and the first three verses of the chapter. The first three verses in the epistle to the Hebrews. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, I want in particular this morning, of course, this Good Friday morning, to call attention to the words, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The author of this epistle in these three verses is introducing what is to be the great theme of the entire epistle, and that is the glory and the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was writing to Hebrew Christians, people who had been brought up in the Jewish religion, but who, having heard the Christian gospel, had preached it, had believed it, and had become members of the Christian church. But for various reasons, they found themselves in a position of unhappiness. They were being persecuted and tried. The years were passing, and the Lord had not returned, as they had heard in the preaching he would do, and thus they had become somewhat depressed. And some of them were even beginning to look back with longing eyes at their old religion. Now it was in order to counteract that and to help these people that this man writes his letter. And the theme of the letter, I say, is the preeminence and the all-sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he and he alone is the Savior, the only way to God. So at once he introduces this great theme of his, and he therefore gives us these wonderful statements concerning our blessed Lord and Savior. Possibly there is no place in the whole of Scripture where we have gathered together in such a short and small compass such a wonderful description of our Lord and his glory as we have in these three verses. But there is one thing that must strike us immediately. And that is that there is reference only to one thing which our Lord did while he was here in this world. He describes him, you see, as the eternal Son of God in all his glory. He describes how he returned to the glory, having descended to the earth and having done certain things how he went back and took his seat at the right hand of God again in the glory from which he had come. But I say what strikes us and hits us immediately is that he only mentions one thing of all that happened during the time that our blessed Lord was here on earth in the flesh and as a man, and that is his death. Now then, we must look at this together. You see, this is the theme of this man, this preeminence of Christ. He's greater than the prophets. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than Aaron. He's greater than everybody. He is unique. And he stands alone. But here I say he introduces this one thing, and it's the only thing that he mentions of what our Lord did while he was here on earth. There's not a word about his teaching. There's no mention of any miracle that he wrought. There's nothing here about the perfect life which he lived. He refers only to this one thing. Here is this great movement from the glory into the world, back into the glory. And the only thing mentioned is when he had by himself 
purged our sins. Now there must be some very special reason for this. And of course there is. Why does this man single out only the death of Christ upon the cross? The thing that we are met together to consider this morning. Well, there seem to me to be two main answers to that question. One of them is just in his own immediate context. It is because of what he did on the cross that our Lord has been exalted to sit at the right hand of the majesty on high. The Apostle Paul puts that for us very plainly in the epistle to the Philippians in the second chapter where he puts it like this. He says, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, because of this, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every other name. So he introduces this element here because it is the preliminary to his taking his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high in the everlasting glory. But the second reason is still more important, and this is the one that we must consider together. He mentions only the death of Christ upon the cross, and nothing else, because this is the key event. This is the vital event. This man keeps on making this same point. Let me put it like this. Our Lord came into this world. He left the everlasting glory and took unto him human nature for one great reason. It wasn't merely to give us certain ethical teaching. It wasn't merely to give us an example as to how we are to live. All that is involved, thank God for it. But that isn't why he came. He left the glory in order to die. Here it is, you see, in the very introduction. He then puts it again still more clearly, perhaps, in the second chapter in verse 9. Listen. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That's why he was made a little lower than the angels. That is why he was born as a babe in Bethlehem. He came in order to die. It was the deliberate object and purpose that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. In other words, this is the great theme of the epistle, as it is, of course, of the whole of the New Testament. Our Lord's death was not an accident. Our Lord's death was not an afterthought. Our Lord's death was not something that was contrived by men primarily. He came in order to die. This is the central, crucial, unique event. He humbled himself. He came as a man and in the likeness of sinful flesh and as a servant in order that he might go to that death on the cross on Calvary's hill. In other words, he did this because it was only in this way that your salvation and mine could be made possible. Now then, my friends, we need to consider this. There are teachings in the church, alas, as well as in the world at the present time, who not only do not see this, but who even deny it, and would have us believe that our Lord came into the world simply to announce that God loves us. That, they say, was the main object of the Incarnation, that he came to tell us that God loves us all, that the whole trouble and tragedy with mankind is that he doesn't know that God loves it. But we are told God loves everybody. And if only men and women realized that, how much happier they would be. So God sent his Son into the world to tell people that God loves them. And he came to make that great announcement. So when they come to the cross, they put it like this. That what is happening on the cross is that God is telling us that though we crucify his Son, he still loves us that there he shows his love to us in a picture. I've sent my only son. You crucified him, you killed him, doesn't matter. I still go on loving you, as I've always done. And they say the same about the son himself. That he there on the cross is simply saying, though you're doing this to me, still I love you. And God loves you. 
In other words, it is nothing but an announcement, a proclamation, a teaching. But all that, it seems to me, gives the lie direct to what we have in our text this morning. No, no, my friends. What was happening on the cross on Calvary's hill was not just an announcement. What was happening there was that God in Christ was doing something. Christ was doing something which makes forgiveness of sins possible. He is not merely announcing that God does forgive sins and forgive everybody now. What he's saying is, after he had by himself purged our sins, there was an action taking place. It's not just an announcement, not just a proclamation. It was an event and a crucial event. In other words, we can not hesitate to put it like this. That if what happened on the cross on Calvary's hill had not taken place, there would be no forgiveness. The cross, the death upon the cross, is essential to forgiveness. Without it, there would be forgiveness for no one. Very well, that's the thing that is stated so clearly for us in this word that we're looking at together this morning. He purged our sins there. Sins were being dealt with there. Something was happening about our sins, without which, I say, there would be no hope for anyone and no possible reconciliation unto God. Now, that is the only adequate explanation as to why this man here in this introductory statement singles out the death upon the cross. The only thing mentioned in the earthly life of our Lord. Why? Well, because it is the crucial event. It's the central event. It is the most essential event. Very well, then, let's look at it together as this man puts it before us. What exactly was being accomplished on the cross? That's our fundamental proposition. That something was happening there, something was being done there. There was an accomplishment. What is it? Well, I've tried to divide it up for you like this. Let us look for a moment at the strangeness of the work that was accomplished on the cross. The strangeness of this work. And this man puts it before us in a most extraordinary manner. Did you notice the contrasts that are involved in his statements? What happened on the cross on Calvary's hill is the most extraordinary, the most amazing, the most astounding thing that has ever happened. Have you seen the wonder of the cross? Have you seen the marvel and the amazement of it all? Come and look with me for a moment at the cross. There you are looking at a little hill called Calvary, and you see three men crucified upon crosses. Look at the one in the center. What do we see here? Well, you say, I see a man there nailed to a tree. And you're perfectly right. He was a man. And yet, you see, this man's whole point is just to say this. God, who at sundry times and in divers men, has spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, a man, Son of God, both in one, in that strange person on the middle cross, man, God. But go on, what else do you see? Well, you look at him and you're given the impression of extreme poverty. While he lived in this world, he had no place whereon to lay his head. He never had a home of his own. He never seemed to have owned anything. He was always lonely and possessed nothing. But here he is now even losing his life, even that's being taken from him. Nothing left. Extreme poverty. And yet, you see, the point we are told about him is this. That God has made, appointed him, heir of all things. Here he is. The one in this extreme and abject poverty. 
As Isaac Watts puts it, all riches are his native right, yet he sustained amazing loss. He has nothing, even his life goes. And yet he is the heir of the whole universe, the entire cosmos. Everything belongs to him, and yet he, here he is in extreme poverty. Oh, yes, says the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, Ye know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that though he was so rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. It's all there in the one person. Extreme, abject poverty. And yet the riches of the universe, the airship of all things. What else? Well, of course you look at him and you're impressed by his utter weakness. He was arrested and didn't seem to be capable of defending himself. He staggers as he tries to carry that cross up this little hill of Golgotha. He's weak. He's helpless. He seems to have no strength. Who is this so weak and helpless? Child of lowly Hebrew maid. Who is he? Well, the answer that we are given is this. He is the one by whom God made the worlds. He is the one who is also upholding all things by the word of his power. Now I do ask you, my dear friends, look at this cross, look at the paradox, look at the amazing contradictions, look at the things that meet together, the utter weakness, the absolute helplessness. But he is the one through whom the whole world has been made. It was by him that God made the worlds, gather together the things out of which the world was to be made and put them in their right order. Not only that, he is the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. Everything would collapse were it not that he kept them going. As the Apostle Paul puts it again to the Colossians, it is by him that all things consist. He has sufficient power that he not only made the world, he keeps it going, he holds everything in position. And yet there he is, I say, dying in apparent utter weakness and helplessness. Who is this that hangeth dying while the rude world scoffs and scorns, numbered with the malefactors, torn with nails and crowned with thorns? Tis the God who ever liveth mid the shining ones on high in the glorious golden city reigning everlastingly. Who oh, is he in Calvary's throes, asks for blessings on his foes? Tis the Lord, O oh, wondrous story, tis the Lord, the King of glory. At his feet we humbly fall, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. Weakness, and yet almighty strength. What else? Well, there he is, I say, between two thieves. Condemned as a malefactor. Robbers, thieves, the whole atmosphere is one of sin and of shame. There he is between the two thieves. And yet I'm told at the same time that he's one who is capable of sitting down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He's on the throne of the universe. He's the lawgiver. He's the righteous judge. Amongst malefactors, yet the Lord of righteousness and of glory. And then look at the final thing we are told. You look at those crosses and you see nothing but shame. Cursed is every one, says the law, that hangeth on a tree. There was nothing more shameful than this. To be put to death in that way and manner. It was the final curse, the final shame. And there are the people mocking and cursing and jeering. What utter shame. Who is this who's in this shameful position? With the thieves, amongst the malefactors, and despised and rejected of men. The answer is that he is the brightness of the glory of God and the express image of the person of God. He is to the Father, if you like, what the rays of the sun are to the sun. 
He is the full expression of the everlasting God. The glory of God is in him and shining through him. The everlasting glory, that's who he is, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. But here he is in utter shame. The most shameful thing that could ever happen to a human being. And yet all these things meet in the same person. And then finally, of course, he dies. But who is this that is dying in this weakness and amidst this shame? Well, I say again, he's one who will soon be seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, waiting until all his enemies shall be made his footstool. Who is he who dies? He is the one who says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever believeth in me shall never die. Here then is this extraordinary strangeness of this which happened upon the cross. It's all a part of the message, my friends. You've got to realize who this blessed person is. This is not just a man. This is no mere human religious teacher or political agitator. This is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. This is the one through whom all things were made that are made and without whom nothing was made that is made. Here he is, I say, the one who upholds the whole cosmos in the might of his power and strength. There he is, dying in shame and weakness, in sorrow. It is the strangest, the most remarkable event that has ever taken place or ever will take place. Look at that cross. Behold the strangeness of what is happening there. But let's go on. What is the nature of this strange work that happened on the cross? What is this? Why should the Son of God be dying on a cross? Why should this glorious person be in such a condition of shame? Why should the all-powerful, almighty one be dying in weakness? What is this? Here's the question. Here's the whole secret. Here's the meaning of it all. What's it mean? Well, the answer is given. When he had by himself purged our sins. It's the only answer this man goes on giving it right through this great epistle. Let me give you alternative translations. Having made a cleansing for sins. Or if you prefer it, to make purification for sins. What does this mean? Well, what he says is this. That there on the cross, he removed sins by purification. He purified them away. He made expiation. What is this? Well, to answer that question, of course, you must go to the Old Testament. He is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament types. And in the Old Testament, this is what you find. If anything became defiled in the temple or anywhere else because some sinful person had touched it, if something became defiled in that way, what they did was this. They sprinkled blood upon it. And as the result of the sprinkling of the blood of some animal that had been killed upon it was that it was delivered from the defilement of the sin. The sin was purged or purified away. It was a stain, as it were, that is removed by the power of blood. You can think of the obvious analogy. Stains fall on a cloth or on some metal, and you have to apply some chemical to remove the stain. You purify the thing from the blot and the stain by the application of this chemical. That's the picture that we have before us in this extraordinary work. He purged, he purified sins. He got rid of them by what was happening there upon the cross. What is the meaning of this, I ask again? And here the whole Bible answers the question. You have teaching concerning it in the Old Testament about the burnt offerings and the sacrifices and the paschal lamb and in the teaching of the prophets, and it's the great theme of the New Testament. Let me put it simply and quietly in these terms. Sin makes us guilty before God. 
And sin also defiles us, stains us, leads to blots upon us and upon the soul. And what every man born into this world needs is to be delivered from these two things. The guilt of sin, the stain, and the pollution of sin. There's the great problem. And what this man says is that there upon the cross our Lord was dealing with the two aspects of our problem. He removes sin. He takes away the guilt. He takes away the stain. How does he do it? With his own blood. There was nothing that had ever been discovered that was powerful enough to remove the guilt and the stain and the pollution of sin. All the offerings and the sacrifices of all the animals of the Old Testament couldn't do it. He came because he alone could do it. And in that one act, he's purging sins. He's taking them away. He's removing them. How does he do it? Well, I like the phrase that is here in this authorized translation, but which we've got to admit and agree is not in the best manuscripts. We read here that when he had by himself purged our sins. The expression by himself is not found, I say, in the most ancient manuscripts. But the authorities are all agreed that the word that is used carries and conveys that very impression in itself. You see, it means this. He didn't use his power to get rid of our sins. He didn't devise some marvelous method to get rid of it and do it through somebody else. He didn't do it by teaching. He didn't do it by example. He didn't do it indirectly by some word or by using some other person. He didn't do it by using his almighty power. Well, how did he do it? The answer is that he did it himself. He did it by himself. Which means this, of course that when he came into this world, he was made of a woman, he was made under the law. He put himself into our position. He took our nature upon him, not only that, he identified himself with our sins, that's why he asked John the Baptist to baptize him. He had no need of baptism, but he said, this is right, with us we fulfill all righteousness. He puts himself alongside us, he stands with sinners, he does it himself. He doesn't send an agent. He doesn't send an angel. He doesn't raise some great men. He can't do it by a teaching. He himself has to come. So he leaves the courts of heaven. He's born as a babe in helplessness. He lives an ordinary life and he's baptized. He puts himself into the position of a sinner. More than that, he renders a perfect obedience to the holy law of God and never broke it in one jot or tittle, but above all on the cross. This is what he's doing. He takes your sins and mine upon himself. As the Apostle Peter puts it, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, not by an agent, not by a substitute, by himself. He takes them upon himself. God lays them upon him in his own body, with his own shed blood. He purges our sins himself. Our sins were laid upon him. And he received the punishment that was due to you and to me. That is why he groaned in spirit at the grave of Lazarus. That is why he was sweating drops of blood in Gethsemane. That is why he cries on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was experiencing the wrath of God. His Father's wrath upon your sins and mine was upon him. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. He there is purging sins. His blood is shed, let loose, and it washes the sins away. And thus he purifies us from sin. Thus he answers the law of God and reconciles us to God. Thus, I say, he takes away the defilement. 
And the result is, as this man goes on to say in the 10th chapter, in the 19th verse, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest of all by the blood of Jesus. He's made a new and a living way that we, defiled, unclean, can stand clean, spotless, pure before God in the holiest of all. That is what he was doing. And he did it himself. He is not merely announcing, I say, that God is love and that he'll forgive us. No, no, he's making it possible for God's love to forgive. He's satisfying the righteousness of God. He's making a way of salvation. That is the nature of the strange work that takes place on the cross on Calvary's hill. But let me go on to emphasize the completeness of the work that he did. And this in itself again is a wonderful theme. When he had by himself purged our sins, the author of this epistle deliberately there used what is called the aorist tense. Having purged. And the air is tense is a tense which conveys the notion of something that was done once and forever. A completed action, an action that never needs to be repeated again and never will be. Once and forever. Having purged, he's done it. He's finished it. There is nothing more that ever needs to be done. It never needs to be supplemented. But not only are we told that by the use of the air is tense, we've got this further extraordinary expression. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. This is a wonderful thing. Go back to your Old Testament and read the accounts of the high priests entering into the holiest of all once a year, with the blood of the sacrifice to make atonement for the people. The sacrifice was accepted. But you never read that the high priest sat down. Never. He entered in with the blood and he sprinkled it, and then he walked out again. He never sat down. Why? Well, the answer is given repeatedly in this very great epistle. The answer was that the work of the high priest was never finished. It was never completed. Listen to this. All that he says in chapter 9, verse 9, was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, that's all it could do. It could give one a kind of purification of the flesh and in an external manner, but it couldn't purify nor purge the conscience. And again in verse 10, it is not possible, chapter 10, verse 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. They simply covered it over. It was a temporary expedient. So the high priest went in, and he remained standing, and he walked out. But this man, having once purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Why? Well, the answer is this. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He's finished the work. He cried upon the cross, It is finished. Every demand of the law has been satisfied positively and negatively. Nothing more needs to be done. He has obtained 
eternal redemption for us. The work he did, he did once and for all and forever. He never dies again. You don't add to it, you don't supplement it, you don't repeat it. He died once and forever, having purged. It's been done, it is done. The great transactions done. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of God? Impossible. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Who is he that condemneth? It is God that justifieth. It's finished. All who are in Christ and who believe in him and who have been purged by his act upon the cross from their sins are eternally safe. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Very well, my friends, let me draw just some two or three conclusions as I close. And they are inevitable conclusions from this teaching. The first is the depth of the terrible problem of sin. Sin is such that this had to take place before it could be forgiven. Sin is not a slight or a superficial problem. Sin is rebellion against God. The wages of sin is death. Sin is horrible in the sight of God. Here it is exposed by this act on Calvary's hill. But secondly, isn't it obvious also that this is the only way whereby we ever can be forgiven or salvation is ever possible? Do you ask me to believe that the Son of God, with all his power and glory, would ever have come to this position, to the weakness, the shame, the ignominy, the suffering, the condemnation, the death, and all the agony and all it involved in his holy body and in his spirit? Would that ever have happened? Unless... It is the only way whereby men can be forgiven. Is it conceivable that the Almighty Father would have averted his gaze from his only begotten dearly beloved Son and have allowed him to pass through this agony and shame if there were any other way? Indeed, our Lord himself asked the question in the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it be possible... Let this cup pass by. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And that means this. He turned to the Father and said, Is this the only way? He wasn't merely shrinking from physical death. He was shrinking from the bearing of the wrath and the punishment of God and God turning his face away. He said, Is there no other way? The answer is, There wasn't. And there wasn't because God is just and righteous and holy as well as love. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And he must punish them. He said so. And he does. And the only way whereby you and I can be forgiven is that our sins be punished and dealt with. And they have been. That is what happened on the cross. He purged our sins by receiving and bearing our punishment. It was the only way. There was none other that was strong enough to bear this. God had made Adam perfect, but he wasn't strong enough. He fell. No use making another perfect man. He'd fall again. No, no, that you and I might be saved. It needs an incarnation. The Son of God must come and take unto him human nature. And he did. The brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The one through whom all was made. The one who sustains everything. He came. 
He has a helpless babe. He died in helplessness on the cross. Why? He's a he alone. He's strong enough to bear the guilt and the punishment and rise triumphant o'er it all. There was none other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gates of heaven and let us in. Very well, my final word to you is this. This man introduces this great statement with these words. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake, spoke, in times past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us in his Son, spoken. Have you heard him? Has he spoken to you? Have you heard the message of the cross? Have you heard the word of God streaming from Calvary? What is it? It's this. Repent. God is telling you there that he's a holy and a righteous and a just God. He's telling you that he's the judge of the whole earth. That it is appointed unto all men once to die, and after death, the judgment. That's what he's saying. That's a judgment. That's a judgment upon sin. Yes, and he's saying, you are to be judged. Everybody's to be judged. Man is a responsible being. And God will demand things of us. We will all stand before God and give an account of our lives lived in this world. We'll be asked what we've done with the soul. Judgment. And what he's telling us is this, that we all by nature and as the result of the lives we've lived are all damned and lost. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All your patriarchs, all your prophets, even Adam, all sinned, all failed, all men failed. How then can we stand before God? Here's the answer. God hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. God so loved the world that whosoever, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You notice what it says. If you don't believe in him, if you don't believe that on Calvary's cross he was purging your sins away, purifying you from them by shedding his own blood, if you don't, you perish. And perish inevitably. But whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. My friend, the message is that the Lord of glory, the express image of God's person, the creator of the universe, bore your sins in his own body on the tree, that you being dead unto sin should live unto righteousness. He's speaking. God is speaking. God's addressing you. And that's what he's saying. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. Have you seen it? Have you heard the message? Have you heard God speaking unto you? What is he saying? He's saying this through me. I am an ambassador for Christ. As though Christ did beseech you by us, we say, Be ye reconciled unto God. The way is open. You have nothing to do but to believe that the Son of God purged away your sins on the cross on Calvary's hill and rose again for your justification and is at this moment seated at the right hand of God in the glory everlasting, ever living to make intercession for you and preparing a place for you and will come again and receive you unto himself that where he is, you will be also. God spake. God is still speaking.
Have you heard him? Let us join in singing our closing hymn, which is hymn number 176. We are singing the second part of the hymn only. Hymn number 176, part 2, beginning at verse 7. Join all the glorious names of wisdom, love, and power. Hymn number 176. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.